What is up, Church of Darkness members? We will be returning next weekend with a brand new episode. Super excited to be back. Lots of fun to be had. Lots of stuff to catch up on. This week, we kind of want to do a best of episode. We want to take some of the things you more than likely haven't heard because I think we got our biggest boom around, I would say, episode 49, 48. So here's some bits you haven't heard, you know, yet if you're new to the podcast. And if you have been listening for um quite some time, here's some bits you more than likely love. Um, I'm very excited for the new year. I am very excited to be back with you guys again so we can have more fun and have our weekly apocalyptic acceptance therapy. Without further ado, here is an audio-only exclusive best of episode, Rafael Martinez, American. Biden is a moderate, and I understand it. I understand it. I've come to accept it. I wasn't, we weren't going to get any better. It was over. You know what I mean? Like, once Bernie was still sitting there struggling, we watched that debate together, and we were like, Bernie's dying here. Like, they're just, like, ending him with everything. They called him a Russian asset. They called Tulsi Gabbard a Russian asset. Well, they called Andrew Yang a Russian asset. So I'm starting to see a theme here. Don't you see how the hard progressives end up getting called Russian assets? Even though Tulsi Gabbard a little bit and her gender pronouns thing is kind of a little weird right now. But she's out of Congress now, so we don't have to worry about her. But you know, I still like Tulsi for the most part. But I still find some of her views a bit questionable. But like whoever they don't like, they call a Russian asset. And that's, and that's a liberal religion too. The Russia Gate thing. Like the Mueller report came out. Rachel Maddow was crying, crying on air about the, uh, it didn't prove anything. And that, and that's another thing. Like a lot of these people get so bought in. And I think even though Rachel Maddow knows that this is all a game and politics is all, you know, cosplay, she falls for it. still. it's a work, bro. It's a work in pro wrestling. We have this thing called kayfabe and kayfabe is the overall carny idea that this is all real. You know what I mean? And you keep kayfabe even when you're out um, in the street. You keep character. And when things happen that are fake in a match, it's called a work, bro. It's a work. All right? And when real things happen, it's a shoot. But sometimes you can work your way into a shoot. And that's what happened with Rachel Maddow. She worked her way into a shoot, brother. She she believed the work that was the Mueller report so hard. This Russia Gate idea. Like, oh, no, it's definitely Russia. It's definitely Russia. She worked her way into a shoot where she's crying on air about it. And everyone's doing it. And it's not even that. I think we've all worked ourselves into a shoot with Joe Biden. Like, we talk about how progressive he is, but progressive compared to who? Donald Trump? That's like comparing hepatitis to AIDS. It's still hep. You know what I mean? It's still lifelong. You still got it. You know what I mean? We worked ourselves into a shoot. The QAnon people worked themselves into a shoot. They believed it so much that they bought into it. And, that, and this little crack of realness happened. Like it, once they saw it, oh, wait a minute. This real life thing happened and Q says it's part of that. They worked themselves into a shoot. And now here we are, a country of pro wrestlers and cosplayers. That's all we are. We're all maintaining kayfabe. We're all working ourselves into a shoot. Social media is the biggest work. It's the biggest work. You cut your promos on there. You know, you have your like little, you know, Facebook statuses where you're saying all the right things. You never say what you really feel because if people wouldn't know what you really felt, they'd get rid of you really quickly. You know, you put the pictures you want people to see. You put the tweets you want people to see, the videos you want people to see because you're working a shoot, brother. 
You're trying to work shoot people. You're working to make people believe, shoot, that you had this better life. We're all working. We're all workers now. We're all pro wrestlers. We're all, no one shoots anymore. Even shoots don't feel, this, this is supposed to be a shoot. This isn't even a shoot. I'm just going to go on YouTube. I planned some of it. It's, it's not even a real shoot. I'm working you now. And they enjoy it. They're watching and they're enjoying me working them. They don't know what I truly believe. I believe everything I've said tonight. Not necessarily. Because it's probably something they said tonight that I don't really believe. I thought it was funny. I'm work shooting. This is called that. It's a work shoot. That's it. It's work. But life is a work. You know what I mean? That's what it is. It's all a work, brother. Like, no one's been shooting since the 70s. The second, you know, the second we got <laughs> to like a Ronald Reagan presidency, it all became kayfabe. And the reason why it became kayfabe, and thank you, Tulsi Gabbard, for putting me onto this. At that time, they repealed an act that made sure that all news organizations had to show both sides of the argument. It was called the Fairness Act. They repealed it. CNN is now working you from a liberal stance. MSNBC is working you from a liberal stance. Fox News working you from a Republican stance. OAN and Newsmax, whatever the fuck those other weird ones are, Working you from a, you know, Republican stance. Alex Jones, who the fuck knows where he's working you from? The way you need to start looking at America is not just pro wrestling. I think pro wrestling in terms of actions works. But as the overall country and the overall system, if you really want to get to the truth of it, it's a strip club. It's a strip club. Us, the Johns, not you, all right, spelled differently, all right? You're a good John. But one day, John, you will be a John because... Listen, you're not going to go to a strip club at least once in your life. It's ridiculous. You got to go. You can't go now. Even though I know some places that might, you know, not, you know, check the IDs. You know what I mean? They might let us in. But yeah, we'll save that for another time. Save it for another time. But at the end of the day, it's like the Johns keep that club open because they're there Monday through Thursday because their wives are wildebeest and they don't want to deal with them anymore. They're done. All right, they're, they, they, they've, they've reached the end. And listen, there'll be some lesbians in there because sometimes their wives are wildebeest. It happens. People fall apart. Some people don't maintain their, their look. I'm, I'm working on it. I've lost 20 pounds recently. I'm working on staying in shape. I'm keeping my wife, all right? But, like, but that's what happens. You go to a strip club because you want to get the fantasy. I've seen dudes mark out for strippers. I think she loves me, bro. Working themselves into a shoot. Like, oh, no, you were willingly paying the money, getting into the fantasy, and now you think it's real? Just because you vote for a politician, you think he's going to do what you want him to do? That's not how it works. What happens is there's a VIP area in strip clubs, the champagne rooms, and it's sexy, and it's really nice. And you have to do the private rooms and the private dances. And it's all, and if you have extra money, you might get something else going on. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that's what it is, right? Those guys get to, you know, have the private time with the politicians. And they get to influence them. They get to tell them little things. Hey, pass that bill, and I'll donate money to your next campaign. I'll donate money. To the DNC to keep, like, basically, like, Tulsi Gabbard was talking about on Joe Rogan recently. If you were to have, like, paid sponsor labels all over the Democratic Convention, you'd be kind of horrified who's been donating to it. And I'm not surprised because money in politics is a well-known thing. But at some point, our vote has to be equal to their money. And the only way that happens is if we stop voting for the same-ass people who are doing the same-ass corporate political bullshit. We get to choose who we spend our dollar on, our stripper dollar. If I don't like that one, I'm going to the stripper I like. The one that you know gives me the fantasy I feel is most right for me. And I'm going to give her my dollar and my vote. Simple as that. Take it, away from the <clears throat> take it away from the person who's getting the more money in the champagne room money, the VIP money. Just take it away. Take your vote to people who care about you, especially in your local elections. Because just... Going to party line does not help anyone in the future, okay? Because here's the thing. Donald Trump talking about making America great again was always going to fail because the country's not built that way. 
going back to brunch Obama 2015 America, guess what? That's not the way either because that's not how America is built. Slave owner and founder Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to slave owner and founder James Madison. And he told him, rebellions are as natural to the republic as storms are to the natural world. America is in the biggest storm it's ever been. It is natural for us to want something more, to want something more progressive. The strip club is called the Great Experiment, and we keep the Great Experiment going. Us Johns keep that thing going. And that strip club is still in business at all hours, no matter who the manager is. I, I watched people. They, they were like crying over this guy getting a job because they started doing this whole imagine what he sacrificed. Imagine what he gave up for love. And I'm like, really? What he gave up? He's still rich. Yeah. It's good. He had it good. I'm sorry. He got to go on Oprah and get rid of his family. I can't do that. I would love to go on Oprah and get rid of some of my family. I mean, get, oh my God. I love for Oprah be like, sugar, tell me what happened. <laughs> what did they do to you? Well, they were never supportive. They made fun of my dreams. I was fat and they kept giving me McDonald's coupons to go eat more. So they weren't necessarily helping my health. You know what I mean? They cared more about money than my feelings. So yeah, I think I'm getting rid of my family. What does he have to complain about? Nothing. You had to play dress up most of the time. You didn't have any real responsibilities. We had, to, we had to go places? Wave a hand? Shake a hand? Give a hug, maybe? Maybe that was too much for him. Oh, what will ever I do? You had a great life. It didn't go all that bad. You know... He he was just famous for being born. It's like the epitome of white privilege, but there's these people. The same people who are BLM are celebrating this shit. Enough. Where do you met? You know, the founding fathers were alive today. And they saw us worshiping the royals like this. They would, well, first, if they came to today, they'd be like, whoa, there's a lot of free blacks around here. <laughs> was not expecting that. Woo-hoo. That's brand new for me. Secondly, look at you people. We rebelled against these people. They're losers. But I envy Harry because he 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 pulled off the dream. Everyone dreams of finding a way of telling relatives they can't stand to go fuck themselves. I dream of it every day. You know what? Here's the shit, right? Now, granted, Harry's family seems to be a bit, you know, on the racist side. But I would still sacrifice some of my own relatives to be in his family. If you told me, here's a list of relatives, pick which ones that gotta go. I'm picking at least 20. And it's not even like regular 20. It's like I'm going to slit their throat and bathe myself in their blood for Illuminati sacrifices to get into the royal family. That's how good Harry has it. That's how good he has it. I'd give anything for one eighth of it. And now there's probably people watching this show going, I wonder if he's talking about me. Well, if you feel confident in my love for you, then it's not you. If you have to, if you have to question it a little bit, it is what it is. You might be on the Illuminati sacrifice train. Because I too want to live my life as Harry. There's a second act in these things. In life, there are second acts. Look at David Grohl of Foo Fighters. Kurt Cobain kills himself, and then he goes on the form to fool the Foo Fighters. 
You mean to tell me there's not one part of him that goes, I call a lucky break there. I got to have a legendary career, even though I thought my career was going to end right here. So sometimes you got to take the good with the bad and also acknowledge when the bad gives you something good. And I am acknowledging that I will go through some horrible stuff involving relatives to get into the royal family. So this is my pitch video, really. If you want someone who's willing to risk it all, I'm your guy. There's a woman who just won a case in Australia over the rights to her husband's sperm. Now, you're probably saying, well, what's mine is yours and yours is mine. Isn't that in the ceremony? Kinda. I don't know. Never been married before. But she is looking to use this right to impregnate herself after he has died. What disturbed me about it is the arrogance this kid's going to have. He was not a kid chosen by fate. He's a kid chosen by science. He is going to think that he is the greatest fucking child there's ever been. My dad gave me life through death. And I guarantee you he's going to claim to have psychic powers, dude. He's going to get into the grift. It, it, it sets up the ultimate grift. What if this kid's like the Antichrist? And I feel bad for him. Because he's dead. He has no idea this is happening. Who knows why he didn't have a kid with her while he was alive. Maybe he knew it wasn't a good idea. Maybe he's like, our genetics don't work well. I'm not giving this chick my kid. Maybe he had always envisioned getting someone else pregnant. But he was like, well, look what I'm stuck with before death. I'm not doing that. I will not sully my own seed. Which, that's a very harsh way of looking at it, but there's something up. What happened to his body, his choice? That's all I'm asking. And I imagine how hard it is for him. You know? He's up in heaven, hanging out, you know? He's been on this long line to meet Jesus. He's finally going to have, like, all the answers given to him. Jesus, on the other hand, has been doing this forever, and he's just kind of bored because the same questions all the time. Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? And like the first thought this guy has is like, holy shit, Jesus is black. Like, I heard that. I read your mind. I heard that. And I get that a lot, actually. A lot of people are always surprised I am, maybe darker tone. But that's me. I was raised in Galilee, and that's how I do my thing. So what questions do you have, dude? Like, what do you want to know about life? And of course, he asks, what's the meaning of life? And Jesus goes, yeah, yeah I guess that again, right? And he starts going into it, and the guy is, like, mesmerized, right? Like, he's like, oh, my God. Like, Jesus is telling me directly what it all means and what my life meant and, you know, how I could have been a better person, but now I'm still in this eternal beauty of heaven and nothing bad will happen anymore. And I'm just, I'm just, and, like, he starts feeling this weird sensation because his soul is still tied to his body a little bit. This dude's, like, having a fucking stroke here. He's already dead. I don't understand what's going on, but I'll, I'll just keep going because maybe he's fanboying out, and this is the way he fanboys out. And he, like, starts grabbing his crotch. Peter? Peter can't come here? And St. Peter comes with his little tablet. Like, he's been taking roster, like, who's in, who's out. And he's like, Jesus, I don't have time. Like, dude, what, what's going on? He's like, Peter? Peter, is he? Is he coming right now? And Peter's looking at him like, I, I think he is. I, dude, I, I, I had no idea. I didn't know he was like, like Peter, pull up his life. I want to see this real quick. And he cut to like this moment of his body where his wife is extracting his semen. And Jesus just looks at the guy and goes, oh, you're a sick bastard, ain't you? And the guy's like, no, what, what, I don't even know what's happening. You're letting your wife do that to you? You're letting her get you off after you've died, dude? And you're doing it in front of me? What kind of fucking disrespect is that? I let you through the fucking gates? I gave you a fucking dope-ass testament 2,000 years ago? And you're fucking coming in here disrespecting me like this? Ah, he's fucking out of here, Pete. Get him the fuck out of here next. Send me, send me the next person with some dumb-ass questions. So Peter, like, lights him on fire and, ah. Uh... Satan's kind of bored, too. You know? The pandemic's really took a toll on him. 
You're new here? Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Um, so what are you here for, man? Like, what, what's, what are you here for? My wife. I, she was, she was jerking off my dead body to extract semen from me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not good. That's not, that's not holy. It's not holy at all. I didn't, are you into that kind of thing? Okay, well, you're here now. So, uh, get used to torment, you sick bastard. I gotta take this phone call real quick. Hello? Oh, hi, Jesus, yeah. Yeah, he's here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at him now. Yeah, he's not coming now. He's not coming now. No, I, I think he might have just came all he can at this point, yeah. He's all, he all come down. Mm-hmm. Well, it was good to hear from you. Good to hear from you, yeah. We're still on for that final battle called Armageddon, right? Okay, cool. Just wanna make sure, make sure. Just wanna stay on track. Contract. Great. Oh, is that? All right, let me know. All right. No problem. Okay, bye. Hey, good news. Good news. You're upset with your wife now, but don't worry. She'll be here sooner rather than later. And as for your kid, he's a real piece of shit. Just you wait and see. This is the foolish shit era, and you know what? You gotta use it to your advantage. There's a woman who recently killed her husband because she thought he was cheating, and it was because she saw pictures of him with a skinnier woman that turned out to be her years ago. Embarrassing. Very embarrassing. But if I'm her lawyer, I know already know my I know what my case is. I stand before the jury and go, ladies and gentlemen, Mafia Martinez, and I want to talk to you about my client. I want to talk to you about how she was in a relationship with a man, and they were in love. Those two had spent many great years together. So much that a lot changed in that time. When my client saw those pictures and didn't recognize herself, that was trauma. Yes, that was trauma that she blocked out. And to be honest, him having those pictures says to me he was looking to body shame her. And that's a problem. You look at a murder, but I see a protest for body positivity. She would not stand to have those pictures thrown in her face. Now, I know my client has already admitted that she confused herself in that picture, but that is also trauma. So I think you'll see that my client was in the right in just defending her truth and defending her. Her energy. And unless you have lived experience, you don't know what that feels like. Have you walked in the shoes of a fat Guatemalan woman? I think not. I think not. Her husband made her feel away. And if there's anything I know about life now, thanks to Twitter, when someone makes you feel away, you got to make them feel a way back. Now, I don't think I would win the case on that argument. But at the very least, you got to go for it. Right? What if what if the people in the in the town are the cult and the Mothman is just a ploy for whatever they're doing? So they all act like they don't know what the Mothman is, but they really do. And that's how they get people to come to the town and like spend money in the town. Yeah. And then maybe they take some of the people. That's another thing. They found like a table at one of the Mothman spots, like in one of the munitions rooms. And they say it was in the outline of a cat and a cat had been sacrificed on it. Maybe that's the real story. That's the real fucking story. The Mothman's a ploy. The Mothman's a ploy to get people to come. 
the, to the people of Point Pleasant, I'm not saying you're a cult. But I'm not willing to you know, dismiss that idea. Maybe they are the cult and they're bringing people in to, you know, to go investigate the Mothman and they sacrifice people to the Mothman or to whatever demon they're worshiping that tends to fly at night. I don't know, but I do know I'm going to Point Pleasant when all this, you know, opens up again. I hope my girlfriend comes with me because if I'm going to disappear, I want to disappear with my girlfriend. I don't want her living life without me. You know what I mean? Like, no. Like, if I disappear, because here's the I know, like, if I disappear, my girlfriend's going to be really dedicated to finding me. But for how long? You know what I mean? Like, she's 29 right now. She's really going to be there 55 still trying to look for me. She's probably going to get remarried or some shit, which I, I refuse to allow that. If I go disappearing because of the Mothman, I'm be like, well, listen, sir, bring me back because she's not moving on without me. I wouldn't move on without her. I wouldn't. I, if she got taken by the Mothman, I would just be sad all the time. And that would be my new identity. Hey, what happened to Ralph? Ugh. His wife got taken by the Mothman. Never the same since. And now like my, my house would always be dark and only one lamp is on as I watch the same TV reruns all the time. I go through every Instagram we were ever a part of. <laughs> and my whole thing is I'm hunting the Mothman to get Christina. This is the movie. All right? Okay, oh shit. No, this is the movie, right? So Christina gets taken by the Mothman. And now I got to dedicate my life to finding the Mothman. And then like the only way I'm able to find him is that like you somehow remember something from my past. And you go, I just had a premonition. I think I know where the Mothman is. And we go into the woods. And then it becomes like a, a story of brotherhood. Where we're learning about each other, and you're le- I'm learning how to grieve Christina's disappearance, and you're learning how to get me through it by being supportive. And then we actually find the Mothman, and I got my gun out about to kill the Mothman. Cause I think it's gonna bring me like you know some kind of a closure. But then I put my gun down because he's just a creature. He was doing what he had to to survive. And as much as I miss my wife. Killing the Mothman won't bring her back. I am a creative fucking genius. Right here? Creative genius. But my job could be worse. You know what I mean? I could always have worse jobs. You know, like... I think about pilots, for instance. You know, pilots... People will go, oh, man, flying a plane must be dope. But they get paid like shit. Yeah. Now there's this new diversity push to get more diverse pilots. And I've never been on a plane going, you know, this turbulence wouldn't have happened if we had a Puerto Rican pilot. Like if, you know, we had a sister behind a wheel, things would be very different on this flight. Never thought that once. But people are fighting for it. The life of a pilot, well... It's not a glamorous life. Most pilots become pilots because they ran out of other options. You know, it is one of those things where it's like, well, I graduated high school. That's kind of enough. If I take a few of these classes, I can make it happen. Most of these pilots are married. You know, they try other jobs, but things just never panned out for them. You know, they've done the best they can with what they got. They married their high school sweetheart because she's a, she's a joy to be around, you know, Magdalene is a joy to be around. She's fantastic. Great, great wife. Beautiful eyes. She was the prom queen. He wasn't the prom king. He was a runner up though. But she was so respectful. She refused to dance the prom king. And that's what made her marriage material. So he marries her. Justice for the prom king. Justice for the prom king though. He should have gotten that dance. He, he campaigned hard. His just do. Just do. But as we've learned... Justice is gray sometimes. <laughs> Snyder <laughs> reference. Anyway. But yeah, you know, Magdalene is a good person. You know, they got a kid on the way. I, he's got to make some moves. So he becomes a pilot. You know, he goes to the little school, this little program, becomes a pilot. I'm going to fly through the sky, you know, and maybe that will inspire my kid to reach for something more. Yeah. And who knew his old man could fly, you know? I, back in the day, everyone said that guy was never even going to finish college. But now he's flying a plane through the sky. 
Yeah. He's living the dream. Pretty kinda. Impressive. You know? Yeah, pretty impressive. It's, it's pretty great. His wife can say, my husband's a pilot. And, you know, women love that shit. It's like, wait, your husband does what? Well, yeah, he flies planes. Like, he's breaking through the sound barrier and shit. Not necessarily on the plane, but on commercial flights. But, you know, they can he can lie and go, you know, sometimes they get into smaller planes. Because no one knows how aeronautics works. I mean, no one knows that commercial pilots can't be jet fighters, too. You know yeah. what I mean? No one asks those kind of questions. So, you can get those lies off all the time. But... You know, he becomes a pilot and he's, he's away every now and then, but he's always focused on his family, man. He's always, I'm doing this for my family. I'm like, I'm doing this to get the mileages so we can start going on vacation. And now that I fly there, I can tell him everything's good. I, I, I have so many discounts from the airline. I have so many ways to get in through the TSA. We wouldn't have to get checked by TSA. I'm a fucking pilot. No. They trust me. So he's providing a better life for his family. His kid's born, kid's a little dim, they say. Not that smart, but he doesn't believe that. He just thinks the kid hates school. He's going to find his way eventually. A few years in, he starts realizing that the raises aren't really coming. You don't get paid well as a pilot. Apparently, you get paid really shitty wages. And the truth of the fact is, life of a pilot, you're constantly on the go, living out of hotel rooms, living out of a bag, bouncing from town to town. All states are like a blur to you. All airports are a blur to you. The only thing you look forward to is coming home and spending time with your family, hanging out with your wife, Magdalena. Hanging out with your kid, who's, you know, thinks you're the greatest dad in the world and stuff like that. He thinks you're so cool. Like, my dad flies planes. And you bring him a little toy plane every now and then. And he's like, oh, thanks, dad. And he adds to his little collection of planes he's got going. He's really proud of you. You know, he really goes, my dad's a pilot. He goes to school and goes, my dad flies fucking planes. So what's your dad do? Work at the fucking Piggly Wiggly? Fuck your dad. Mm -hmm. That's how I think eight-year-olds talk, because that's how I spoke when I was eight Mm -hmm. years old. But as the years go on, you know, it starts to wear on you, the jet lag after a while. You start realizing you're away from home a lot, and you start getting lonely, you know. You spend a lot of your nights in bars, because if you you feel like if you drink hard enough, you'll get some sleep. Because sometimes, even when you have jet lag, you don't even get some sleep. I've had that before. I've been so tired from a flight, I couldn't sleep. Like ridiculous. I can only imagine what they go through. So you start hitting the booze a little bit. You start getting a crew of, you know, stewardesses and pilots that you kind of like to hang out with. And soon they start putting you guys on the same rotation because it seems like these guys got good chemistry. So why not have them hang around each other and shit like that? Little by little, you and Magdalena just having issues. You're becoming kind of a stranger in your own home. And the sex is really boring now. Like, you've done all you can at this point. You're not really an adventurous couple. I mean, you've only been together your entire lives. Your first time was with each other. You don't know anybody else, you know what I mean? So you're hitting the sauce pretty hard, and you're like, man, when I come home, I don't feel the love anymore. My son stays in his room listening to his heavy metal music and shit, and my wife almost seems bored that I'm back. Because in a way, she's learned to live without you. She's learned to move on with her life. She has everyday things that she's got going on that you know nothing about because you're off gallivanting in the fucking skies and shit. Even though at first it was impressive, now the wear and tear is starting to happen. So just sitting there realizing your life at home is not getting any better. You meet some new people. You meet Joanne. You meet Joanne. Stewardess. You guys spend a lot of time together. Mm -hmm. Hanging out with Joanne. She too is having a hard time at home because her husband's an asshole. Constantly cheats, constantly hits her and shit. Not good lifestyle at all. Joanne goes on these flights to get away from home. That's really what it is. Even though her husband has enough money to make sure she never has to work, this is her escape. And as you two, you know, you, you, you realize, you know, I like having Joanne. She understands me. She understands what I'm going through. So you know what? Joanne's kind of like my work wife. I'm going to lean on her and she's going to lean on me and we're going to get through this life together. That's my bestie right there. You go home and things are just getting a little weird now. Dinner is not as good as it used to be. It's more frozen dinners now. She's not cooking the way she used to. Mm, She's not, you know, up keeping the beauty as much anymore. That's tough. That's tough. And then you realize you're tired when you get home. So you sleep most of the days you're home. So you don't even really see your family. Yeah. It's just a bunch of fucking darkness, really. Ah, just, <laughs> dark, not darkness, <laughs> darkness. It's beginning. 
the darkness. Oh, it sure is. So you start realizing, fuck, like this can't be my life. So you start trying to do things on the weekends, but you realize no one's really enthused because they know you're going to fly out again tomorrow. And what's the point? You know, they don't want to make memories with you anymore because you're a ghost in your own home. You start going on some more flights and you and Joanne start getting to know each other a little more. Her life's getting rough. You like Joanne because Joanne reads a lot of books. That's how she passes the time with all the flights. And she's a hardcore student. Any flight she can take, she fucking takes. She's got to get away from Bill. Bill's an asshole. Got to get away from Bill. Right? So you start hanging out with Joanne and then one night, you're having a couple of drinks. You've been leaning on each other all this time. And then you decide... To lean in. Mm. You lean in and you have the forbidden kiss. Dang, how could you? Uh, Dan, what's his This pilot's name? His name is Dan. Let's call him Dan. Dan, okay. How could you, Dan? Dan, how could you, man? But the thing is, that's what Dan's going through, man. He's feeling, you know, exhausted. He's feeling like he's he's not loved at home anymore. And Joanne's the only person that really understands him. You yeah. know what I mean? So they decide, you know what? Listen, we can't talk about this kiss anymore. Like, we can't do this. Like, let's never talk about it. Let's just continue on. We should not have done it. It's a mistake. So he goes home, and that's all he's thinking about is the kiss. Because he hasn't felt this spark in a long fucking time. And his wife knows something's up. You know what I mean? She, he's a little weird right now. He's always on his phone because he's texting Joanne about just everyday stuff, quote unquote. But he's really building a rapport. So she starts feeling a little weird. The son, he's in high school now. Getting in to the rough crowd. A crowd he shouldn't be hanging out with. But then again, his dad's never home and his mom can't keep control of him. So he's hanging out with all the bad kids. He's hanging out with this one kid, Stevie. Stevie's a real pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. Stevie, his parents are in and out of rehab. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So he kind of runs his own life, really. He's doing whatever the fuck he wants. So Stevie's kind of like cool. He's been left back a few times. So he's in high school, but he's technically 19. Technically. Because no one really knows what his real age is. It's a little fucking weird. So anyway, Stevie has dreams of, you know, being in a band, but he's fucking always getting high and shit like that. Always like blowing up people's mailboxes and shit. But the son, you know, Kyle, he loves Stevie. Yeah. He thinks Stevie's the shit. Stevie has the balls he'll never fucking have. Yeah. He's like, Stevie once told his dad to go fuck himself. And that's what Kyle wants to do every time his dad comes home from the fucking goddamn airlines. It's like, you're not here enough and shit, but he doesn't have the balls to do that. That's just not what Kyle does. So Dan's just sitting there watching his whole life crumble around him. And Magdalena's starting to catch on. Yeah, She's starting to realize this guy's not happy anymore. And she's starting to feel a little unloved. Things aren't necessarily going well for her either. Mm -hmm. You know, she was the prom queen. And now she's just the housewife. Bored. The wine starts around noon. It's not starting at six anymore. It's starting at noon because there's nothing to do in this town. Ain't shit going on. Yeah. She wants to go back to work, but every time she has a conversation with Dan, it's kind of a huge fucking argument. What? Am I not man enough to hold down the household? You know, and shit like that. So Maggie's like, well, fuck it. I won't work then. I'll just be a fucking slave to fucking wine. That's it. You know, so he goes out again and she starts feeling a little lonely. But guess who comes over looking for Kyle? Stevie. And Stevie's cool. She knows about Stevie because, you know, Kyle talks about him all the time. His love of music, his dreams of being a rock star and shit like that. He's a free spirit. He still has time. He still has the energy to really go there. So she kind of likes, she kind of lets Stevie stay over a few nights to hang out with Kyle and stuff like that. Loves Stevie. Thinks the world of Stevie. But while this is going on. Dan's back on the on the trail, you know, like flying around in planes, just whoop, 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 having a good old time. Now he's gone from alcohol to drugs because he's got to numb the pain. He's got to numb the tiredness. He's got to numb the loneliness. And guess who's there? Joanne. And one night they decide, fuck it. No one gets us but us. So we're going to get us, if you know what I mean. All right. So Dan and Joanne are getting it in, my friend. Oh, they're getting it in. It's like all the time. They wake up feeling guilty, but that guilt only lasts a few seconds because they're back back. at it. 
He secured the bag. Dan secured the bag. Much props to brother Dan. Yeah, Dan not only has a mistress now, he has a wife that's crumbling at home and a son who thinks he's an asshole. So he's got the great pilot life. So, but back at home, Magdalena has a few drinks one night. Oh. Stevie happens to be going to the bathroom one night. Oh. He's staying over, hanging out with Kyle. And let's just say she makes a move on Stevie. Oh. And her and Stevie are now getting it on. Oh, she you know down right? bad. She down bad. She's down bad. She's down tremendous. She, oh, yeah. Quarter of the earth. That's horrible. Oh, oh, yeah. Kyle's sound asleep has no idea what's happening. Sound asleep so he can't hear the noise of Stevie banging his mom. Has no idea what's going on there. And Dan comes home, not to catch them or anything like that. Dan comes home at his regular time and realizes she's got a little bit more pep in her step. Son's a little different. She's dressing prettier. She's, you know, excited about shit. What's been going on? She has to be excited about. But then again, she's noticing son's a little different with Dan, too. He's a little more friskier in the bedroom. He's a little bit more adventurous and stuff like that. Both of them know something's going on, but they both know if they say something, it's game fucking over. Can't ruin what was a perfect marriage. They were high school sweethearts. They were destined to be. So Dan think, doesn't think anything of it. You know what I mean? He's all right. You know, maybe she's as happy to see me. Maybe she's just, you know, realizing we need a little pep in our step. She doesn't know that I've cheated on her with Joanne. So there's nothing to say. There's nothing to, everything's good. I have Joanne on the road. I have my wife at home. I have it all. But then things take a little bit of a turn. One night they're having some drinks and Joanne says, you know, I'm thinking about leaving my husband. And she always says this. It always starts this way. I should leave my wife. You should leave your husband. Blah, blah. They're never going to do it until one day Joanne says, I actually saw a lawyer about it. Red flag right there, Dan. She's got ideas. Don't know if you have the same ideas as she has. So now you realize, fuck, this might get real. And that night you get a little too drunk and you don't remember if you used the condom or not. Oh, down. Here we go. And guess what? While that's happening. Magdalena might have forgotten to use one, too. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. So guess what? Dan comes home with the, with the utmost pressure of, oh, my God, if Joanne is pregnant, my life is fucking over. Everything fucking dies today. And Kyle's starting to figure out that Stevie's banging his mom. But you want to hear some sick shit about it? Kyle doesn't mind because Kyle wants Stevie as a dad. Oh. Kyle thinks Stevie's fucking dope. Replace my dad. My dad doesn't want to do rock band stuff with me. My dad doesn't want to do shit but give me toy fucking planes. I'm 16 years old. I am over that shit, old man. Your pilot job is garbage. You barely have any money. I can't even go to college on the salary you have. This family's down horrendous right now. Down horrendous, oh, dog. Oh, no. And guess what? Dad comes home. Maggie's sitting there cooking dinner. And they both feel guilty because they both know something's not right. And that night, they try to get it on. But guess what? It's just not working. It's just not getting together. Right? So they lay in bed staring at the ceiling. And Dan is like, Maggie, what's wrong? She's like, there's something I have to tell you. And he's like, what? She's like, I've been having an affair. And Dan is gutted because what he didn't think would happen has happened. He's lost Maggie, the rock of his entire life. But he wasn't thinking about that. He was banging Joanne now, was he? He was not. He was not. So then he just lays there. And of course... Not wanting to be the guilty one becomes really self-righteous about it and goes, how could you do this to me? He's like, who is it with? Who, who have you been banging? And she's like, I've been banging Stevie. Now, here's the problem, right? He's a two-time adulteress. No. She's an adulteress and technically a predator. Yeah. I don't know if it balances out. I don't know who's more guilty. This is a hard one. This is a hard she one. She's about to catch a case depending on what state she in. Low exactly. Key. And he's about to catch a baby with yeah. a case of child support if he's not careful. You know what I mean? Both of them got to go to court. Both of them got to go to court. Low key. So then she just lays it out for him. Like, listen, I'm not happy here anymore. And he's like, 
what do you mean you're not happy anymore? She's like, you're always away. You're always flying around. I need a husband who can be here with me at home. You got to transition and do other things, sweetheart. There has to be something you can do at the airline that keeps you home. And he's like, fuck that. Because here's the thing. Flying has become his life now. He loves that shit. Because he used to be drunk, high, banging Joanne, doing whatever he wants. He's free. But when he's at home, he's in prison. It's fucking, his mind is now warped. He tells her, I'm not going to give up piloting. And he's leaving it next morning. He tells her, you know what? When I come back, we'll talk about this. And she says, you know what? When you come back, there won't be anything here. Oh, the story's getting heavy, yo. And then you know what? He says, I cheated on you twice. Oh, Woo. Woo. I ain't even capping this story's getting crap. I'm not even capping this is legit, yo. Now it's all on the table, baby. Now I'm ready. For, I'm ready for this. Let's go. Let's go. And he's determined to tell her. When I come back, we will figure this out. And she's like, motherfucker, there is nothing to figure out. You cheated. I cheated. This marriage is fucking over. It's done. I don't want to be with you anymore. I'm going to my mother's. And he tells her, bitch, if you take my kid from me, I swear to fucking God, I'll ruin your fucking life. And she's like, my life's already fucking ruined. I met you. Oh, my God. Dark shit's going on in this household. And Kyle comes out going, I knew you were a scumbag, Dad. But totally disregards the fact that his mom's being yeah. Stevie. Because he loves Stevie so much. Yeah. That's another subplot of his whole situation. I think Kyle's in love with Stevie. I could be wrong. Oh, but man. But that's a whole different story in itself. Which is totally fine. Yeah. But Kyle's got to come out the closet at some point. Because Kyle feels like he's been abandoned by his dad. So therefore, he looks for the strength in other men. Yeah. And he's almost found the strength in other men. You know what I yeah. mean? Because he's so broken on the inside but on the same he's also finding himself through music so he's writing this beautiful poetry about how he's coming into himself and he's learning what he truly is a gay man good for kyle because he's the only fucking balanced one in his entire family yeah the only one anyway dan goes he flies and he's miserable miserable he decides to be alone. He doesn't even want Joanne's company. He just wants to be alone. And he's at the hotel bar again, drinking by himself. And Joanne shows up. And she's like, I got to tell you something. I'm pregnant. So Dan just nods, finishes his drink, and goes to his room. Stays up the whole night, snorting coke, doing opioids. Gotta numb the pain, bro. Gotta numb the pain. Next day, he gets behind the wheel of a plane. Joanne asks, is everything all right with you? Like, about what we talked about last night? She's like, listen, like, I know it's, you know, not the right thing. She's like, but maybe, you know, you leave your wife, you know, I leave my husband, and we start a flying school. And we have a family, me, you, and this kid. We can start over with each other. Dan just nods, like, yeah, 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 it's fucking, yeah, whatever. Let's talk about it after the flight. You know what I mean? I don't know what I'm talking about this shit. She's like, okay, okay. I'll just talk to you later. He's like, all right, good. Talk to me fucking later. Get the fuck away from me. She gets away from me. Now Dan's flying the plane. His co-pilot's just going on and on about his fucking life. And his life's fucking boring. His life's going great. All right, him and his family just came back from Disney World. They're having a grand old fucking time. And Dan just starts slowly gunning the engines a little faster. Faster than he should. He takes the wheel and starts tilting it a little down. Right? And his co-pilot is like, oh, maybe he's avoiding the clouds. But he's going a little too down. And Dan is just facing down his life. He's lost his first wife because she's banging a 19-year-old. My son hates my guts. Joanne's pregnant with a baby I don't want, and I don't think I convinced her to get an abortion. It's game over for me now. And in the midst of that, he stops and he turns the wheel back up. You want to know why, John? Why? Because he is a pioneer. He is a trailblazer. He's a diversity hire. He is the first Puerto Rican to fly from Tallahassee to Anchorage, Alaska. And he's going to show these honkies 
that he can handle alcoholism, infidelity, a crumbling marriage, and drug addiction just as much as they can. He fought for the civil rights of pilots. He fought for the right to be a pilot in a mostly white field. And he's going to prove them wrong that we got the stuff. So salute to all the people who want to be those pilots, all the black, brown, whatever gender you are, people who are fighting to have the right to have a life like that. I salute you. That is a cause worth fighting for. Martin Luther King would be so proud of Dan and Nat's story. Because not only did he let his life fall apart for the cause, he stayed true to the cause. Oh, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with that. <laughs> oh, that Martin Luther King. She cheated on his wife. <laughs> <laughs> she cheated on his wife too, yeah. Well, maybe, good point. Maybe Martin Luther King really empathizes with him there, you know what I mean? Anyways. But anyways. But yeah. We like Martin Luther King, don't we? We love Martin Luther King. That's, that's, we love Martin Luther King. Yeah, I preface that. We love Martin Luther King. Yeah, let's okay? get that right. Uh, uh, yeah. We but he he did what he that. did, all right? He double dipped, all right? It is what it is. Look, it happened. We had a dream. It was in the movie Selma. Yeah. have to acknowledge it. If Ava DuVernay said it happened, it happened. That's the way I see it. But no. That's what I think about when I think about these diverse pilots. That's the life they're fighting for. So congratulations and salute to them. Pioneers of the sky. May you fly high and may you be high. May you be alcoholic while doing it. Good luck to your spouses because that marriage is fucking over. Today, on Memorial Day, we remember our warriors, the people who fought for America, the people who put the work in, the ones who made sure that we still had freedom, such as the Antifa rioter, the trust fund baby who decided, hey, these protests need a little bit of rioting. Let's light the Walmart on fire. Let's light the whole city down. So BLM looks bad on television. So people think it's them doing it. That's a way to really help the cause. Shout out to the QAnon supporter. January 6th was a terrible loss, but you tried your best, didn't you? You tried to save us from a pedophile ring that was being controlled by the elites. Thank you for your service. Thank you to military police who just let the QAnon people run rampant all over Washington. Thank you for your service. Let us also remember the military men who brought over the Nazi scientists in Operation Paperclip. Thank you for giving us such a complex history. Now I'll never look at NASA the same again. To all you people on Twitter who were tweeting the hashtags, you're the real warriors. You really came through. No laws got passed, really. No one really defunded the police, but you tried your best and that's all that matters. Now you can go back to brunch and forget all about this racism shit. It's not trendy anymore. Oh, and if you think you know what's happening in Israel and Palestine, you don't know. So shut the fuck up. Enough of you Twitter people, you Twitter warriors, you fucking keyboard assholes. There are real men out there, real women out there, fighting for our freedoms every day. And all you're doing is staying in your underwear. 
yelling at people on the internet. Enjoy your barbecues, you self-righteous fucks. Because there are other countries that don't allow barbecues. They don't allow celebrations. They don't allow anything. And here's the shit. America's not really fascist when you really consider we can say whatever the fuck we want. And to the CIA who's watching us right now, can we keep mentioning Bohemian Grove and all this other shit? Keep watching. John, put that song back on. I'm not done yet. Whoa. That's not even a song I meant to play. Maybe it is. Maybe I should run. <laughs> but we're going back to what matters most. The hard war we had to fight against our fellow American all through 2020 is over. It's time to tolerate each other again because the world is open. You are no longer fighting for Democrats or Republicans. You're fighting for the sanctity of our country, for our sanity. It's time to grow up now. This, you know, either or thing kind of doesn't work. It's over. It's time to put on your big boy and big girl pants and be an adult and deal with people you disagree with. Because at the end of the day, that's what those men and women died for. For the opportunity for us to sit here on this podcast and call people we don't agree with dumbasses, our assholes, our fuck faces, our dumb son of a bitches, our people who shouldn't be breeding children, or people who quite frankly don't deserve the freedoms they have. To my gun nuts, I salute you. To my anti-gun people, I salute you. May your culture war battles matter to someone on Facebook because they're not mattering to the greater good of anything else. I know the last year and a half has made you feel like you were in a war, but you weren't. You were just bored at home. And the shit that was happening already just kept happening. We're no better, we're no worse. We're really just America doing what America does. John, do you have any words of wisdom for America? Be better. Be better! A 16 year old is asking grown ass adults to be better. This is the state of our times. This is where we're at. Boomers, Gen Xers, Millennials, they're all full of shit. All of them. Enough. Stop crying. Get your shit together. Go get a job. Go handle business. For the love of God, there are jobs out there. They may not be great, but I don't know. It's better than sitting at home, I think. America was built on achieving your dreams. And now it's time to put away the petty bullshit. On this Memorial Day, let's remember the men and women died so we could have dreams and so that we could make better choices and so we can be better the way John wants you to be. You know, I feel so patriotic. Do you? Well, what does it matter? Because we both know how this shit is going to end.